Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are and wherever you're watching from. We're so glad that you're with us today, whether you're live on LinkedIn or on YouTube, or if you're listening to the podcast after the fact, we're always happy to have you here and hopefully you have a great experience listening. So before we get into today's show, just a couple of reminders. We're in this transition. If you watch on YouTube regularly, we've got the TechSmith channel, which has got really great content. If you want to learn about making video, you want to learn about using images, we've got Andy and Aaron and some others. Our tutorials are out there. And now the Visual Lounge is its own channel. And pretty soon, within a couple of weeks, we're going to actually not stream to the TechSmith channel anymore. It's going to be its own YouTube channel. And we're doing this because we want to make it super easy for people to get what they want and need out of this channel, as well as on the TechSmith channel. So we're expanding a little bit. Now it's two properties. We think that's a good thing. But don't forget, go over there, like, subscribe, do those, leave your comments over there, chat over there, do the things that you're going to do on the Visual Lounge channel that helps us make sure that you're going to find it when we stop actually pushing live on the TechSmith channel. And of course, you can always go listen to the podcast after the fact if you're interested in that on your favorite pod, pod uh, easy for me to say, podcasting platforms, Spotify, Apple, Google, uh, on Amazon, you can tell your voice connected device. I won't say its name, but you can always tell it to play the Visual Lounge podcast and it works. I tried it. It's pretty fun. So with that said, we're here for a show though, because we've got a great show. We're going to be talking about stories. I think inherently we all love stories. We're going to talk about the power of stories, why stories can work for learning, why stories can work for media, whether you're doing video or images, things like that. And let's get into it by introducing our guest for today. Hadia Nurdin, uh, sorry, Nurdin. I, I knew I was going to say something wrong here. She's going to call me out on this because I've messed up her name so many times already on accident. So Hadia Nurdin has two decades of experience in learning strategy, instructional design, e-learning development, and facilitation. She worked in corporate training, sorry, corporate learning before choosing to, uh, to found her firm, Duets Learning, where she's worked with a wide array of companies on a variety of topics. She speaks at events and industry conferences and travels teaching courses for the Association for Talent De Development, or ATD, as some of us know it. Hadia holds an MED in Curriculum Studies, an MA in Writing, and the Certified Professional in Talent Development designation. She's the author of the book, Story Training, Selecting and Shaping Stories That Connect, published by ATD. And I can say, having sat through one of her sessions, a fantastic speaker and deeply knows her, her stuff about story. So welcome. Hadia to the Visual Lounge. Hi, Hadia. Hi, Matt. Thank you so much. I've watched this show many times, so I'm really well, excited to be here. Well, thank you. Well, well, good, because now you know that I never do anything purposely as a mistake, <laughs> but I make lots of mistakes. So we're, we're so glad that you're here, and I'm so glad for the chance to have met you. Um, but one thing I know about bios and about these things that we read about our guests and say about our guests it, it's, it's a sliver of the things of who you are and what you do. Is there anything before we jump in today's show that we should should know about you? Wow. Well, you know, I I do believe that one of the things that have has influenced my career as an L&D professional is taking a what I call a cinematic approach to instructional design and development. So I love um, really just creating that immersive experience where people feel like they are part of it. So what that means is I have a deep love for films and books and stories all around. So, um, you know, I just love the fact that no matter what your background is or what you do, you can infuse some of that in this career of learning and development, no matter what you've done. Um, and so I've taken advantage of that. And I think that's really, really guided the way for me. So I I'm always make a lot of movies references and a lot of book references and, and all of that and, and I'm noticing that some of the references I make now are aging me a little bit I had this class where I think I showed a picture of the Philadelphia story and had the audacity to ask what's this movie <laughs> like I don't know what that is what are you doing like oh no what's happening what, ha what happened here so yeah um i have modernized my movie selections a little bit but uh yeah i am definitely uh a cinephile and that has influenced my work a, a great deal 
Well, that's well, fantastic. Feel free to drop any cinema references you want today. Uh, we can always catch up people that don't don't understand them. And and you know, I feel like I've, as I've gotten older, I I know less and less. Like I used to know all the movies, and now it's like, well, <laughs> we know a few. Well, this can be like little movie assignments. Like if you haven't heard it, then hey, put it on Absolutely. your your watch list because you can find these movies nearly everywhere now so yeah absolutely well i want to start our conversation uh pretty broad because i think with story there there's so much we could go into and as i was mentioning before we started i've got a ton of questions but let's talk from a really broad perspective why do you think story is so important to to think about and build into and we'll call it the work, whether that's maybe learning development. There might be other people who aren't doing learning development, but that story applies to. Um, why is story so important, do you think, to, to think about and to include when, it, when appropriate? Well, at the end of the day, a story is just a tool. It's one of many ways to convey information to somehow get what, what you need, what your intent is. And it all starts with there. That's how I always say, you know, I always get the question, how do you know a story is right? How do you know a story is the right tool to use? Well, it all depends on your intent. Um, you know, there's um, a saying where they say that um, if you want people to think, tell them facts. If you want people to feel, tell them a story. Um, I don't think that thinking and feeling are mutually exclusive, although it feels that way <laughs> sometimes. Um, um, however, you know, the general meaning behind that is what do you want people to do with this information? What do you want them to feel, to believe, or what have you? Um, so understanding the impact that story can have on people, whether or not it's a shift in behavior or a shift in perspective, if, if that's what you're going for, a story may be the way to do that. If you simply want to deliver information, maybe it's not the way to do that. Um, I, I do think that it's important when you are trying to either you know deliver training or deliver some sort of message where context makes all the difference. There's some context that all of us can relate to, and we can see ourselves in, you know, with in, with an empathetic view through the eyes of someone else. Um, but many times we cannot. Many times it's an experience that's form, form, uh, foreign to us, or maybe it's an experience that we don't really see the connections or don't want to see the connections between ourselves and the content or what people are experiencing. So often storytelling is good for that. Example I use all the time is customer service. Even though we all know what it's like to be a customer, when you are the cashier behind that register and it's all coming at you at once, it's difficult to feel empathy for the customer at that point. It's difficult to sit there and go, hmm, how would I feel in this person's shoes? It's difficult to do that. So sometimes story of really encouraging them to see how would you feel if you were a customer and you walked in this situation and tell a story around that and that they can sort of feel that you trigger that affinity for the customer. You can um, help them see things through the customer's eyes and that may lead to the shift in the performance that you're looking for. So stories at, you know, context. Um, and, I, and I think that's one of the reasons why it's so important to use them. Yeah. So I, I love that idea of, of coming at it with intent, right? Having the right intent, having that kind of idea that you're going to shift. I would imagine that there are organizations out there and organizations, managers, individuals who say, yeah, but story is hard. Story is, you know, it's tough to get it to feel like it's right or uh, hard to make story work for us because that's just, we're not creative people. H how do you work with that? Because I think like, yes, I want to feel if maybe the emotion will help change things, but story sometimes feels difficult if we're, we're not good at it. Uh, any advice for someone who might be struggling with that kind of reality that either their organization doesn't want it or personally, there's like, I'm, I'm not good at story. Yeah. So when I started on this journey of speaking about storytelling frequently, I too always started with the story storytelling this is storytelling this is how stories work and i realized that wait a minute i think the story itself is probably step 60. steps one through 59 is finding out what the truth is 
finding out who is immersed in this reality and how can we talk to them and find out what their experience is, what emotions are they feeling, what messages do they want to send to uh, you know, the, the people that they're working with. If I'm thinking of an example of, let's take an example like a compliance training. And I always hear, we can't do train, we can't do stories for compliance training. But the story is not in compliance training. You are correct. Uh, the story is in people complying. So you need to go find the people and ask them what struggles are they having complying. I use ex um, ethics training for an example. Um, I've worked in organizations in the past when I worked internally where we had this yearly ethics training all the time. And um, it, it's easy to sort of just, you know, give people the policies. But at the end of the day, you are asking people to put the, um, the company's interests above their own. And that's a bigger ask than a lot of organizations think. Um, so for example, you may think, well, let's do a scenario where um, a salesperson has to decide they're at dinner and they have to decide whether or not they should pay or not. But the company rules say that you shouldn't allow them to pay i think it's different in different organizations but you shouldn't allow the client to pay because it sounds like this pay for play deal so you know what should you do what should you say in that situation um well you know that's interesting but what if you don't work in sales and you're pushing this out to the whole organization and they're not in that in that um, situation, you know, maybe they work in the mail room and they see a, a box that's torn and everything's spelled out, or there's no two on it. There's, what do I do with this? Those are the struggles that they're going through. It's not, they're not thinking about slide 25. They're thinking about what do I do as a person? What do I do? And those are the stories. So it's not, you're not making up anything at the end of the day. Um, you're not making up anything. You're going to talk to people, finding out what they're experiencing, how they are living this reality that we are putting them in. What will it take for them to shift their behavior? And then a story is simply a carrier. You know, all the story structures and formats that we know are just carriers for this information. So, um, you know, that's what I say. It's, it's not all creativity. There's no uh, long ponytail strumming with your guitar and uh, making up stories. <laughs> that's, not, that's not how it, it works. It's finding the truth, finding the people. And I always tell people, if you can't find the story, you've lost the people. Go find them and report back <laughs> what they have shared with you. Yeah, I, I, I love that. And it makes me, you know, it's interesting what, what brings up memories, right? So I'm thinking back early in my career. Uh, I was in grad school and I, I went to do some contract work for a small company and they were they were really focused on stories and scenario based type learning. And one of the things we got to do was go to uh, an organization. I'll, I'll keep those out of it. But they were big organizations, really big organizations. And I remember we spent a whole day just on like characters and what happens in their organization. Um, and there was no learning developed. Like that was, I was the instructional designer in the room. So mm -hmm. that if they had a question about a, like, well, how would we test that? I could answer, well, we can do a quiz. But, mm -hmm. but really it was all about the scenarios that these people, and a lot of it was the ethics training. So it just made me think of that, which uh, makes me think, you know, like as you're doing this, it makes, I love that you said that like, Go ask the people what they're what they're dealing with. So, how do we make sure that we're getting the right? Uh, I guess maybe let me rephrase this. What's the role of feelings and getting people to feel something in these scenarios? Uh, you know, you talked about the empathy a little bit, but is that kind of the crux of it, or is it see, being able to see themselves in a scenario? Is that what's really important? Yeah. You know, um, w when I give these talks and I ask, why is story so important? Why is it such an effective tool? People always say emotions first. And as I sort of reflect on that, I think, well, first of all, not just any emotion, right? You have to do the work to find out which types of emotions are going to drive what you want. So it's not just this blanket emotion business, you know, mm -hmm. it is having people feel something is at stake or at risk for them personally, whatever emotions that drives, because for some people, as we know, who are there under threat, they feel happy, you know, because they're energized. They're like, this is, this is, and some people shut down completely, 
and are afraid and don't want to engage. Um, and emotion, triggering emotions will do that to some people. Everyone doesn't respond to you triggering their emotions the same. So I don't think it's, I want to move away from this sort of blanket, it's just emotions. It really is, you know, put something at risk for them, put something at stake and explain why something is at risk. They'll feel the emotions that they feel. And um, ideally, because we know we can't make people act or learn, all we can do is create circumstances in which they are more likely to do it. So would you need to understand that what people fear more than anything usually is loss, losing something. And so if you are able to create situations where you can, um, you know, put that at risk, whether it's something material or something personal like reputation or um, a promotion or role, you know, what's being lost here, people can easily sort of put themselves in those types of situations and, and recognize that that's a problem. That's a problem. And how can we help this, uh, this, this person in the course or whatever navigate that? So it's not just any emotions. It is you, it is somehow triggering a person this sense of of uh, either you know loss or joy or what have you and then having them respond accordingly is is my opinion on that yeah well I, I love that because I hadn't thought about that the 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 idea of loss it's not that I'm going to lose something if I'm in a listening to a scenario or going through this training but putting myself, being able to walk in that shoes, that's really powerful. Yeah. Someone actually told me that years ago, and I, I say it all the time, that someone told me people, people don't fear change, they fear loss. And I think about that when back, way back in, in years ago, um, when I started in training and development, this was during the whole, let's convert from these databases to um, a web-based system. And so we had to do all these training for these, uh, you know, people who had worked in payroll for 20, 30 years doing the same control Z, alt F, -N, <laughs> and they were able to do it. And sometimes only they knew the code and people would have to ask them and they would have their cheat sheets and things and the updates would be slow and, and all of that. And so when we came in, you know, we were, most of us were more well-versed in the web. None of us were great at it at that time, but more were more comfortable around the web, we thought, hey, you should be happy. This is great. Now, instead of all those, you know, configuration of the fingers there, all you have to do is, um, you know, hit file, this, that, and the other, and you're done. And, but there would be this resistance. And of course, we would feel like, oh, well, these people don't want to change. They don't like change. And at the end, and now, and of course, I, I, always felt that way. And now when someone told me that, it sort of hit me, actually, what is she losing? What is uh, Martha losing by me taking the system away from her? You know, there could be some sort of social power that she's losing, that she knows the secrets of how to do this. She knows her job. When she comes in every day, she knows what she has to do. But now I'm introducing this new system that's bringing in the unknown. She's not a fear of change. She's in fear of losing her standing, of losing her comfort, of all of those things. And I wish that in our scenarios and our stories, instead of just, you know, um, Martha needs to run payroll for 25 people. How does she do that? We, we actually touched on some of that stuff. So Martha could really see herself in that situation and think, okay, well, I feel more comfortable now, or maybe this is better. Or, um, you know, maybe this is the, the behavior change I'm, I'm, I'm looking for. But, yeah, you know, I, I wish we had more empathy you know, in, in that regard for what people were losing by us taking them to this new system that we all perceived was an advancement. Yeah, I, I, wow, man, I love that because it does feel like I know the changes that I've gone through. That is usually kind of the root, right? Like it's not that, that it's going to be a new system. I'm losing understanding. I'm losing my ability to like, if I, maybe I was an expert in the system, you know, mm. all of a sudden taking that away. So that's, that's really powerful. And that's the big difference between finding the people and, you know, instead of trying to find your stories in this software, which is, you know, how do you run the system and finding your stories in the people, you know, that's the big difference. Yeah. Before we go into our next question, I'm just going to share. There's some love in the comments here for you, Hadia. It's uh, <laughs> one. Uh, it says, 
from Connecticut. Yes, I'm also a big fan of Hadia. Her book even helped my daughter with her college applications and her business pitches. Thank you. So Aww, that's thank awesome. You. Very nice. So Bonita goes on to say, "Me too. Love her book." So there's there's definitely some love for you here in the in the okay. chat. So uh, well, thank you very much. I like love. <laughs> we, oh yeah, we're all about it here on the video. <laughs> but I want to I want to talk about something. You and I had a chance as we were pre preparing for today's show. You said something, and it struck me that you you said that with stories, it's a lot of it's all formula. I think I'm I'm paraphrasing. It's all formula, and massage. You have to massage it to get what you want. And I want to talk mm -hmm. about that because we've talked a little bit about the empathy, the kind of the, the understanding what people are going through, that loss versus maybe you know whatever that loss is. Mm -hmm. But again, getting to like where I want to, if I want to go and create and use scenarios and stories, talk to me a little bit more about this. How do I find those formulas? What are those formulas and, and how do we get to a point where I can apply that? Hmm. Well, to me, there's two sort of layers or branches to the best storytellers and, and how they do it. There's obviously a very, uh, the academics behind storytelling. Uh, you know, I think that when we listen to great storytellers, sometimes we feel like, oh, she just lived this two weeks ago and this story perfectly formed in her head and she's telling us the story and not really thinking, no, you know, what happened to her was a set of events. She had to go do what was necessary to make it a story. So I think when people say I don't have stories is because they may have this perception that um, the story should already be formed in their heads and that's not accurate. I mean, over time, once you um, do this a lot and know the formulas and know that you you know it it works you know you you do start to begin to think of think in story in, in some ways um, but when you're starting out you, you don't some of us never you know quite th get there but there is work to be done in order to um, tell those stories so I, I always say that there's two layers here layer one is just again that academic, understanding what um, and that you must start with intent, understanding narrative structure, um, understanding, you know, the whole, um, the, you know, the climax and how that works and how you start into a story and how it reaches a certain point and then you come to a resolution. You know, there's that an understanding of that and you can learn that in a variety of different ways um, in, in books and, you know, just being observant. But then there's another part of storytelling. And that other part is the willingness to be vulnerable the willingness to show your authentic self, the willingness to be wrong, to be open, and to understanding the that it requires a certain amount of generosity to share these stories with people. And that when you open your mouth, you are creating almost a variant of this story and that it no longer uh, really belongs to you. So I, I tell people that if, if it's a story that you're, you know, that, that you feel that your psychological safety could be compromised, then maybe that's not the story to tell because then we get really defensive about those stories and we want to protect them and we want to be right about what we about our own experiences. We have every right to want to be right about that. Um, but we've all been in situations where we start telling a story and someone gets from it something that we're like, you could not be possibly listening to me if you think <laughs> that that is what the story is about. But remember that they are not actually hearing your story, what they're doing is filtering your words through their own experience. And so you expecting that they are picturing exactly what you're picturing and they're going to come to the same conclusion that you came to, that's not accurate. So you're going to have to really let the story go. So that's that second lay, that ability to do that and to be able to say, because at the end of the day, that's what you want. You know, you don't want people to just take a photocopy of your story and plant it in their head. You know, you want them to invest in it themselves and recognize themselves and think, yeah, I've been in that situation as well. And I see how she handled things and maybe I handled it differently or what have you, but I can recognize myself in the narrative that she's saying. And I'm invested in this story. I'm invested in what she's talking about. That's what you want, not just this photo copy, but you have that takes a certain amount of, again, generosity, a little bit of bravery, uh, you know, to um, allow that story to 
you know, that variant to fly out and let people make it their own at the end of, at the end of the day. So um, as far as like tools and things that I use as far as forms, uh, formats, I always talk about something that I discovered while I was writing the book. Um, it is called the story spine. And if you've ever been in a session with me, you've heard about it. And what I love about it is that it forces you to create a story of transformation, which is the type of stories that I think we should be telling in learning and development. What use is a story if it's not about a change? That's how I distinguish a story from an anecdote. An anecdote is like this retelling of events, which is great and fine. But when it comes to what we are doing um, in any, whether or not you're just doing leadership, you're a leader and you're trying to you know, get the, the team behind you, or you are in some sort of learning capacity, or you are a person who is working with subject matter experts and you're trying to get a story out of them, you're always trying to follow that arc of this is where I am, something happened, and this is where I landed, right? So you're always trying to follow that arc in this tool, the story spine encourages you to do that, where it's a real sort of scaled down version of the hero's journey. And you have this, um, you have this idea where you have the um, the ordinary world where people are today, right? So say you're, you know, again doing something like customer service training or something like that, and you want to talk about how to deal with a, a difficult customer. Well, sometimes you'll talk to a subject matter expert, and they will, for example, um, tell you, well, you know. I just deal with customers this way and this is how they should deal with them. And that's really the content of the course. Okay, well, that's great. But I would prefer to know, how did you get to that point? What, how did you used to be? And then what made you say, you know what, this strategy is better. This method is better. What made you say that? Tell me about the day that that customer came in and cursed you out <laughs> and you decided that this was the best way to handle it. Tell me about, tell me about that day. Right. And it could have been several days. Right. Um, and then at the end, how, what did you learn from that experience and how do you apply it to your your training? So or how you apply to what you do. So that that is sort of that the crux of every story, you know, we're we're trying to find. And then you can use that for your own personal stories. You know, you can use the same thing. It all centers around a change, a change is is what matters so that's one of the formulas is all sort of this variant or take on the hero's journey yeah yeah wow there's about a thousand things to unpack here uh so i'm going to try to figure out which which question i should ask first uh, and i know we have a question from christy i want to get to in a second but i'm curious so you know we i, I want to get back eventually to the kind of some of the structural things but uh, uh let's talk about vulnerability for a second because i think from a corporate perspective, vulnerability is hard. Mm -hmm. uh, it's hard to put yourself out there. You don't want to be the person who's seen as maybe you didn't do something right or you made a mistake or, or, or whatever that point along the change was or it might be that makes, makes it vulnerable for you. So what advice would you give for people who are struggling with that, if any? Uh, because as storytellers, I, I, I listen to enough things that deal with story that I'm like, I can see where that really makes an impact. But I'm not always sure I know how to do that for myself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I would say, you know, first, you do not owe the world a breakdown. Like, you certainly right. don't owe them that. Um, so, you know, vulnerability is earned in, in many ways. I always sort of say, well, you don't, you, you don't owe the world vulnerability, but you do owe them authenticity. It, it really is up to you to decide where the line is. And I think what's helpful with tools and formulas and all of that is that it helps you extract from the story what you need in order to get your point across, right? So that's why intent is important. You need to extract from that experience what you need. And if not, then what happens is this story pops in your head and it comes out your mouth and you're sort of left there feeling like I shouldn't have shared all of that. Mm -hmm. That is why intent is so important. That's why intent matters, right? Um, because it's, is it, what am I trying to get here? I'm just trying to get to people um, understanding why it's important to deliver feedback when they need to deliver feedback. You know, that's why I, if there was an incident where I had, where I had a, a boss that I got fired behind it and all, 
if it's something that is very personal to me and was very traumatized, you, you have to, as an adult, figure out where that, that line is. But there are parts of that story that can be very useful right? Just the fact of, of the way they communicated with you and how it was unhelpful. And you don't have to reveal, you know, um, you know, how trauma, you don't have to re-traumatize yourself in order to tell this story. So that's why intent is so important. The question is, why am I telling this story? You know, why am I telling it? And what do I want people to do with this information? And do they need all of these other bits and pieces. And, and I sort of say that the intent is the litmus test, which you bounce everything against to see whether or not it, it should go and should belong in the story. But I always say psychological safety is first and foremost. Um, so, you know, taking an inventory, um, I talk about having a playlist of stories that we tell and, you know, and, and taking inventory and stock of that and just doing some surgical precision on what you think it's it's for. Because I also do this thing where I teach a thing called the um, perspective story, um, the perspective circle rather. And um, what it is, is it teaches you how to take one event and create several stories out of it, right? So you have this, I tell them first, just list the event. This is what happened, this is what happened. And then next is, that's just one story in itself. You could tell that and, and that's it. But if you want to now be able to expand that story and think of how can I use it in different ways, ask the next question, which is how did I feel when it happened? That right there leads off into all of these different other stories um, based on just how you felt. The last question is, how did other people perceive this incident? And again, just that one story. Now you're seeing it from your boss's point of view, from the employee's point of view, and just this one incident now that used to just be one story that you had one conclusion to because you saw it from all of these different perspectives just grew into something more. And so you may not have to touch on the traumatizing bits. <laughs> you're just focusing on um, the heart of the story and what you got out of it um, based on what you feel comfortable telling. Yeah. Well, I, I love that, especially the, looking at from the multiple perspectives, right? Like how you can see various parts of it. And that, and again, psychological safety being number one is, is so important. So, so two questions from our chat today. Uh, Christy's asking, he says, forgive me if this sounds too high level for me, but just questioning in L and D does there always have to be a story or can a message also be delivered without a story? We've talked a lot about story and importance of story, but mm -hmm. you're an expert about story. Do, should we always be using story in our learning development? I think I have an answer, so, but I'm curious. So this is what I say. First of all, there is always a story. There is always a story. So don't think that there's, there's not one. So there is one. There is a change because L&D is the story, right? Our business is transformation. Our business is change. And if I, I'm saying that a lot of these stories circle around that, there's the question is, can you find it? And are people willing to share it with you? Um, and sometimes there's just a line which that you can't go over. A lot of, I, I, I know when I work with a lot of subject matter experts who are experts or not experts, but um, ambitious is the word I'm trying to say. In their mind, they saw a problem, they fixed it, that's the end of it. <laughs> like there's no, there's no dramatic retelling of my journey uh, with the stick, with the little kerchief on, like there's none of that. I saw it, <laughs> there was a problem and I addressed it, Hadia. So I don't know what you're fishing for, but you're not gonna <laughs> find it here. And, you know, so I definitely have been in those situations before where I know there's a story, but this person doesn't wanna talk about it. That's fine, they don't have to talk about it. Sometimes what I'll do is if I really um, feel like one is necessary because the context is too obscure, like I say, or, um, and I feel like people can't really relate to it, and I need to sort of build that bridge for them. Either I'll talk to other people and then present that a, a sort of a amalgamation of stories to that person and see what they think. Because as we know, in L&D, they are more than happy to correct you. Right. So even if, you know, they don't give you a story, they will be more than happy to tell you that you're telling the wrong one <laughs> and that this is what the story will look like. So sometimes I get that um, as well. So 
I think that, again, my sort of litmus test of whether or not there should be a story is how close, how close will people be able to um, create their own context for this information, right? Mm -hmm. um, if it's something that's pretty foreign to them, if it's something that they're resistant to and they, they aren't willing to create a context for it, then creating one or, or helping them to see one that's really already there. Again, I'm not making it up. I mean, like it's somebody's going to give me that story, give me that information. Um, and so, um, and again, that's why I love people who come to this field from other industries. If you are a learning, if you are an LED professional, tap into that experience, tap into when you were 16, when I was 16, I worked at Popeye's. I'm always tapping into that Popeye's experience because it was nuts. <laughs> so I'm always <laughs> tapping into some of the incidents I had there when I worked at Kinko's, when I worked in retail, when I were, you know, when I worked in software, tech support, I'm always tapping into that, right? And so that helps me create some sort of empathy and feel that and, and you know, I'm not gonna just commandeer it and start telling my own stories, you know, but I'm always, you know, I do have a philosophy where I make it and you break it, right? So I may build something and then you tell me, what's what's wrong with this the resistance i get from storytelling isn't always um we, we there's no story i can't find a story the resistance i get is um it takes too long in the course people just want to get in and out of the course so they acknowledge that there's a story they just don't feel like their audience is going to be patient and that's fine everyone doesn't want to hear about tom's journey you know, I totally, I totally get that. But again, that's if those, if the people say, for example, they're updating the accounting system. These people have been working in a similar system for so long. There's for me to, you know, create a, a story about the journey to an accounting system, you know, because they have the context, they know how to use it. But again, it's, it's close, the stories close the distance, you know, between the content and living that content. And, um, I think that, oh, that's a good one. I just made that up. Um, I think that, uh, you know, telling stories, uh, you know, helps if you do need to close that gap. Yeah. Oh, well, I, I, I love that, that, you know, you can bring those other experiences in because I, I often feel bad when I'm doing that with, uh, you know, thinking about experiences, oh, I had way back here and now I'm bringing it to this, this kind of thing. And uh, especially because I've been at TechSmith so long, it's often like, text myth stories from like 10, 12, 14 years ago. And I'm bringing them forward and people, I feel like people are probably tired of me saying, well, back in my day. <laughs> yeah, uh, there is a danger there. Cause I, I if I were in tech support, I mean, I was working on in windows 95. And so probably <laughs> some of my, when you edit this, like what, that doesn't exist anymore. So like, right. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, I realized that time has passed for some reason. So I, I guess it seems like just yesterday. We were I guess in windows that's what <laughs> Well, so so I love that, but you can bring those perspectives in with a, with some caveats, right? So I love that, and I think what some of the things you're saying actually answered our other question that Bonita had, and she can ch chime in in the chat as well. But she's like, if SMEs don't come back with story, can I replace it, uh, with a story of my own? And it sounds like kind of if it's relevant and you can fit it in there, and they'll tell you they'll tell you that it's broken and it's not. Yeah, they'll right. tell you if it, if it doesn't doesn't work. But it's you know, I, it's just so many skills that we have to have that are that people build whole careers on right and the art of the interview the art of making people feel comfortable building rapport and just listening for stories even though they're not telling you a story like it's there sometimes it's there just right in front of you and they're not saying it in a story format but you can observe it you know, that's one of, that's like the skill of journalism. I, you know, I always say that a, a lot of the problems that we try to solve in L&D have been answered by other industries. They, they already have figured it out. Not, not an issue, right? Um, so people can have these series of interviews and just string a story together based on what they've heard. You know, I mean, it's documentary film, you know. Um, so just pulling that all together, building, uh, you know, this narrative around it. And again, when I say building a narrative, you know, just focus on what is the change? You know, what was the what was the switch that flipped where that person will never be the same? You know, and then what what did they learn from that experience? And then how can that information be used to inform others? Um, sometimes I hear stories and I still don't 
put the story in the training, right? I mean, I use that content for the course itself so I can write other narrative, but it may not, you know, come in a story format. So, um, so, and that's what they used to teach us all the time was when you're talking to SMEs, tell them, tell me a story. The story, it may not be story based at all, but tell me a story anyway, <laughs> because right. I'm going to use this as you know, content for the training. Yeah, so it's an it's a it's an informer informs what you're going to create. Otherwise, I I want to we we've got a, a few minutes left before we go we move on to speed round. But I want to ask you because you at the beginning of the show you said you love like cinema and Hollywood and you know those stories. Obviously, a great place for stories. Um, I am often telling people like, hey, because we're talking about making video a lot on the show. You don't have to you don't have to be Hollywood. You don't have to try to do a Hollywood. And I'm talking about usually the visuals. Uh, yeah, but but from a story perspective, what are and kind of we can do bullet format, however you want to do it. I'm curious, what are the things we should be learning from Hollywood in terms of 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 story? Because obviously talking about learning from other industries, Hollywood has mastered the story. Right. So so right. <laughs> what's the kind of big high level takeaways that kind of like I don't have to be an expert. I don't have to be a deep cinephile to to understand anything we could pull from from what we see in kind of the film yeah. and TV? Yeah. Yeah, I am one of those obnoxious people that people don't want to see. It's like, Hadia was just a movie. I'm like, no, it wasn't. It was an experience. Don't you ever forget that. <laughs> but the way, um, as I've been thinking about this over time, knowing that m most people um, have a life and don't want to be that obnoxious about it, I would say this. For me, the mystery behind film is the way that manipulates, and I will say the word manipulates emotions. Mm -hmm. And just when you think about some of your favorite, now it doesn't have to be a favorite film, it, it can be a scene. How, what did they do in that scene to make me feel a certain way? Why do I like this villain? You know, why, why am I seeing movie after movie of, of Freddy Krueger? Like, why am I, he's a murderer. He's like, not cool. And like, why <laughs> am I waiting for the next Halloween? Why? And, and if there's a lot of movies, there's a lot of documentaries on Flash. I, I watch them on horror films all the time because it's an interesting thing. Their perspective on how do we make people feel empathy for something that they should not feel empathy for? Because you saw it on the, if you saw that on the news, you would be horrified. But yet for this movie, there's that suspension of disbelief, obviously, but there are things that they do. Now, it's not always just fear. There's things through lighting. There's things through the words they say and what they don't say. Um, you know, I love films that use as few words as possible and just through glances and just through looks are able to convey what they need to convey. Um, in writing, in screenwriting, they have this phrase called on the nose in that when you write something, you should say everything except for what you actually mean to say. <laughs> you know, so if it's if you're in a fight with someone, it's like, Chester, I, I'm done with you because you did these three things. First, you did <laughs> like no, that's that's too on the nose. Like you don't talk to him for a week and you slam doors and you burn dinner and you do all those things. You know, that's what you do <laughs> first to convey that those are the three things, you know, that's a horrible sexist example, but that's the point, you know, that, you know, you do all of these things other than outright say, that is what I'm doing. Now, obviously you don't want to build training around that because you want to put the content in the training, but little subtle things like that, that it is the way people are acting and the way people are looking and the expressions and, and all of those things and what they aren't saying that tells the story more than it itself. So what I what that informs me in a more practical example, if I'm writing e-learning, that's when I learned that less is more, right? That people don't just regurgitate you know, um, I think ethics training is important too, Bob, because of these three things, right? You know, instead, this character is going to give an example. They're going to tell a story. They're going to use less words, and they're not going to be as on the nose as they would be if I were just to say, these are these three bullet points. Yeah, it's, you know, it's definitely, yeah, show, don't tell. It's definitely showing how people respond to something rather than telling. And the good movies do that. They are great examples of, of that. 
When I think uh, a lot of good video is is just that, right? It's the visual using the visuals in its fullest, as well as the audio uh, the audio experience, kind of that full body, full immersion, uh, emo and emotionally too. So that's well, I, I, so I love that. Thank you so much, Adia. We're going to move to our speed round here in just a second, but before we do that, you've given us so many great pieces of information, and I've still got about twelve other questions I could ask you, but but. I'm going to save them uh, for the sake of timing here, but I, what I'd love to, to have you share with us, where can people go find more about your work, about story, about what, what resources should we be going looking for to find you and, and more about mm -hmm. using story? Well, I try to keep it simple. Everything's at um, my website, um, duets, as in two people singing, learning.com. Um, and on there, across the top, there's a tab called resources. And I have a whole page of different resources. And one is storytelling resources. Um, I also have on that page, and I talked about this at I think Dev learned last year, which is the science behind storytelling, because I know sometimes to convince our bosses and subject matter experts that storytelling matters, they need a little bit more than because we like it um, and that the emotion and all that. So um, that gives you some of the science. Those are people who've looked into this very heavily of what it actually does to the brain when someone is listening to a story. So you may want to delve into that to bolster, even maybe just to convince you um, um, a little bit more of what you want to do. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you for sharing that. Now we're going to go into what we call our speed round questions. As I've, I've explained uh, for those maybe who are new to listening, <laughs> these are going to be fast kind of lightning style questions and answers, and we'll move through them pretty quickly. So let's dive into our speed round. All right, Hadia, as, as someone who I, I, I know you, you've got your uh, a master's in, uh, was it literature or was it community? Um, one in curriculum studies and one in writing. In writing. Okay. So as a writer, you probably have to read a lot. So what's one piece of writing that you didn't create that you keep going back to? It could be fiction, nonfiction, whatever you like. Hmm. Wow. Okay. I'm more of a theater person, but okay, I would well, say well, we can change it to theater, a show, okay. movie, television, theatrical you know, production. Any play by, um, uh, let me think. Okay, my favorite play, I'll put it this way my favorite play is, is A Raisin in the Sun. And what I love about that play is the different layers and how all through my life, when I first saw it, I saw it as one thing, and then every I see it, I see it differently. And that really sort of is the essence of, of story in many ways in that, you know, you have a story, one version of a story, and as you mature and see things differently, it evolves over time and it changes. And that play um, reminds me of that. So Raisin in the Sun, is that correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Perfect. I'll have to check it out. Okay. So uh, next question. If you could be a hero in any story, because heroes are obviously important to stories, uh -huh. who would you choose and why? The type of hero or a brand already created hero? I'll let you choose. These I would like open. to be the one, I would like to be the one, you know, that they, the oracle, the one that they seek it, it, advice from and who's very sage and who has a walking stick and sandals and they come in and ask and then they go off on their journey and everything goes awry and then they're in the final battle and the villain gets killed at the end and he drops to the ground and it's me standing there with some tea like oh were you were you, were you looking for me so I'm both they thought I was this sage person in the kitchen but at the same time I'm also this action figure so both that's that's, that's awesome I love it I love it so next question in our, 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 our speed round, where do you turn for inspiration? As someone who's obviously super creative and using pulling in story, how do you keep the creative well full so that when you need it, you can draw on it? Well, um, yeah, so of course I mentioned uh, movies, but mm -hmm. also um, I would say um, creative intake of oral information, which is um, eavesdropping. 
<laughs> so listening to conversations and seeing how people talk and interact with each other. And that's one casualty of the pandemic for me. I would go to Starbucks and just watch how people talked and how they interacted and listened. And you can, I mean, it really does inform how you write conversations and writing in all capacities, but definitely when you're creating scenarios, the what sounds natural, what is the what is the flow of dialogue? So being a student of dialogue is uh, important to me. So listening to that always inspires me. That's awesome. And I, I would imagine that this last two years has probably curbed that quite a bit. But I also imagine <laughs> yeah. you get into some of those things and you're like, this is not a good conversation. <laughs> like just naturally not good. <laughs> Call the police. Yeah. Yeah. No. <laughs> All right. We got one more question for you. And I'm going to warn you this is the one that our guests always say is the hardest. We apologize for putting you on the spot, but it's it's not that hard. So we, we just like to turn around and, and say, What's a question you have for me? I've been grilling you with questions. You get to turn it around uh -huh. on me. What's your best interview to date? Well, this one, of course. <laughs> See, it's all planned. It's all that's written right. Ahead of time. Uh, well, you know, it, it's 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 hard to say because there's they're all they're all good in their own way for different uh -huh. reasons. Um, I think the the interviews I typically enjoy the most are the ones where I'm learning, like really learning. Mm -hmm. um, I know. Uh, so I mentioned before the show uh, talking to Megan Torrance and Jess Jackson about diversity, equity, and inclusion. And inclusion. Yeah, it was very yeah. moving for me because I, trying to understand it from different perspectives. Obviously, I come from a, a place that I am who I am and I am where I am and all that stuff. And I'm, I was very grateful to be able to have that conversation in a very safe way. Yeah. Uh, I think, which is uh, a great example of that empathy gap. Right of why story is very useful in that regard because you know people struggle with empathy when it comes to DIB. So yeah, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. It's 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 absolutely true. I think um, I I've had a couple of people I I look up to, and that's always really great to interview because I just feel I'm so humbled to be able to like you said yes to me. You, yeah. You, you said you're gonna come on the show. Who like? So I mean. I, it's hard to pick just one and it wouldn't be fair yeah. to my guests to pick one, but like I've loved this conversation today because I know the importance of story and I like to think I know a thing or two about creating video, which often will pull in story, but then I put the two together and I'm like, I've got a lot to learn. And so this has been very good for me to think about the empathy, think about, you know, where story breaks down, what, you know, how to be vulnerable without being, uh, tragically involved in a way that makes me psychologically unsafe. So uh, I, I think it's uh, been very good for me to hear this. And I'm thinking about a couple of ways I can apply it in the things that I do, um, which is really great. So you're awesome. Maybe, maybe you didn't hear, but I think you're awesome. Anyway. Mm. <laughs> so uh, I appreciate you being with us today, Hedia. Uh, any last thoughts or comments or anything else we should know before before we leave? We definitely froze at the end there. Okay. So you missed all the great stuff I said about you. Uh, so I will make a video clip for you and send it to you rather than repeat myself in embarrassment. Huh. Uh, but I, I didn't realize you froze, but I said a lot of nice stuff about our interview today. So Dang, um, we froze hard. Okay. I don't know We're, who froze. Hydea is frozen. We can't hear me right now, so we're going to end the show. But here's the thing. If you like what you heard today, like, share, comment, do all those things that you would do. Go, make sure you go subscribe to the YouTube channel. In fact, one of the things we can do here is we got some really cool graphics. Oh, look at that one. Let's go. Let's get the right graphic up there. If I can get the right thing up there. Subscribe. Subscribe to our channel. Subscribe to the podcast. Make sure you're doing that. That helps us know that you're you're being we're being successful creating content that you want to hear. And... If you've got questions, email us at thevisuallounge at techsmith.com. Questions, comments, thoughts, guest ideas, anything you want to share with us, let us know. With that said, we always like to end the show on the same way because it's so important for us to continue progressing. And here's what we're going to say, same as it is every single week. Whatever you're doing, wherever you are, we hope you take a little time to level up every single day. Thanks, everybody.